I think we're ready to get started with the final session of the day, which is a free-for-all session where you're free to answer, ask any questions, provide any feedback. Um, and we're going to have Bob and myself and then the DNN Connect folks up here. Um, so I, it's always, there's always like a big pause before someone asks the first question. So maybe I'll ask the first. Oh, maybe not. James has got a question already. We don't have like a long mic, so if you'll, okay. So the question is, what are our thoughts on the DNN store? Well, I actually asked whether or not there are any thoughts on the store. Yes, we do have thoughts on the store. <laughs> Next question? <laughs> no, seriously, um, we just didn't talk about it in the context of the products, but we still have somebody. In fact, we have a couple of people that work on the store. It has an actual business manager. We've added um, some capabilities uh, in terms of uh, some moderated lists. We have blogs. Um, and those are being produced regularly. We're using the extension verification service in conjunction with the store. We're working on changes to the product listings. Um, there's some others in terms so of James relevant looks access products. <laughs> so evs.dnnsoftware.com. How many people know what that is? Not very many. Do you want to explain? Okay. <laughs> so uh, I guess it was a little over a year ago we wrote this uh, service called Eves for short. And uh, what this means is you can take any extension, and it's a free service. Uh, well, I think what we'll do is we'll publish a link to everybody. I mean, again, it's evs.dnnsoftware.com, but we'll provide info to it. There's a blog on it as well. And uh, you can run that through, and it'll test for compatibility with various versions of DNN software. It also looks for compatibility with uh, Windows Azure. And it gives you a full report in terms of issues that are found. I won't say it's 100% correct on everything, but it largely is, and we continually try to improve it. It's a free service. You can run things through there as often as you want. In fact, customers can use it. Yeah, it validates your manifest files. It, manif or it validates your SQL scripts. Yep. So it, it, it actually does quite a bit of and validation. And some people know it doesn't check upgrades. It checks installs. So we actually install this as well. If you have something that installs it in Azure and we check for compatibility with the SQL Azure database. Yeah, so that's only like one aspect of store. But yeah, so the other one that you mentioned was blog. That's a recent addition. So there's a blog on the store site. And for people who are selling products on the store, you can contact the manager of the store and you have the ability to actually post blogs as well. So third party vendors can post blogs on the store. Yeah, and there's a lot we're doing with reviews. Uh, we're working on related products. I mean, there's there are a whole variety of things that we're doing. So yeah. that should help people, uh, vendors in particular, to augment their sales. Thank you. Welcome. But um, the modules on store, one cannot know if the vendor has actually installed the module to these tests. That is partially true. So the, the comment was that. Um, Consumers don't know if the vendor has submitted their module to the verification service. As of a certain date, and you might know, we all modules have to go through the verification service in order to be listed. Yeah, I don't recall the date, but then they'll be published. And we'll also, because that service extracts data about the extension itself, we'll be able to tell people what it's compatible with. Well, I was asking Bob what the date was. It's already in effect. It, it took yeah. effect maybe six months ago. Yeah, so I anything that's been re date, like, uh, put on the store more recently has gone through the verification check. Yes. No, I mean, uh, just, being, just being realistic, it's the same thing as if a car manufacturer goes out of business and, you know, that's unfortunately the way it is. Uh, it's always possible that some other vendor in the ecosystem buys out that company or wants to uh, pay something for access to those customers, but we ourselves, we really don't have the resources to support that. 
Yeah, I think what's been more problematic is sometimes a very small vendor that's producing skins or modules will just disappear. They weren't, they weren't, they're not bought out, they just maybe go on vacation for a month or, and then in the meantime, their customers don't get any support. That's a bigger problem than, than people acquiring one another. Because when people acquire one another, that generally provides some continuity of that product that you bought. But yeah, it's more when the vendor just disappears. That's been a, more of a problem. That doesn't happen often, but it, yeah, it has happened before. Salar. I knew that was going to come up. But, but yeah. It took like five minutes. <laughs> yeah, so the question is, what is the relationship with Telerik? So um, I guess it was maybe three years ago that we announced that we had a partnership agreement with Telerik. And we needed a partnership agreement with Telerik in order to distribute their commercial controls with the open source platform um, because their standard licensing model didn't allow for that. And so um, we started doing that at that point. Um, the relationship that we had with them meant that we had to pay royalty payments to Telerik based on the number of commercial licenses that we sold of our commercial products. Um, but after three years, we made a business decision that the market in general is moving away from server-side controls um, and more towards client-side controls, using more jQuery and things of that nature, and that it may, have, may not make sense for us to continue to pay these royalty payments. And so we disengaged or ended our relationship with Telerik. But when we ended that relationship, it still allowed us to continue to distribute the controls, at least the version that we had at that point, ongoing. And so that was okay for eight or nine months. There was no problems, there, there was no reports of any issues. Then a bunch of new browser versions came out that were incompatible, and that brought the whole issue up to the surface. And so what we've been doing in the last couple months is we worked out a new relationship with Telerik, which allows us to maintain the, the source code for their controls ourselves. So we can fix browser compatibility issues in the RAD controls and ship the customized version as part of DNN. So we have fixed a couple of browser compatibility issues. And in 7.3, there is a, a custom version of the Telerik controls that we'll be shipping. Yeah, just to, to, to be really clear, though, we can only fix bugs, we, you know, so incompatibilities, we can't add new capability, and it's only for the version that we had been shipping. But for, you, for those of you who rely on Telerik, um, it could, should continue to work. You, it'll still be licensed in the same way. Um, one particular thing that's important is for those companies that were relying on this special licensing capability, which gave an unlimited number of developers within an organization the rights to use Telerik. Um, if they bought one, one license of Evoke content, that continues to remain true. So even though you're using a customized version that we ship, you still have the same ability to use it as many developers as you want. Sebastian. So if you have your own license to Telerik, you should use the version that you've paid for, and then you are supported by Telerik. We are, yeah, so we are shipping and testing our product against the version of Telerik that is in our package, not any newer version, because we don't have access to newer versions anymore. It's unfortunate. We hit, um, I guess it was three different browser issues at once between Firefox and IE and yeah, even the latest version of Chrome. I think all related to the RAD editor, which yes. is a pretty main use case. Yeah. The biggest yeah. one was the iPad. Yeah. 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 
which is the same decision <laughs> that we were running into because we wanted to reduce the weight of our products and re improve the responsiveness, performance, I should say, because response, I guess everybody's thinking now of you know, shrinking windows. But, uh, you know, we had the same issue, and so we were writing stuff ourselves, and we started looking at this and the yearly cost, and it just didn't make any sense for us. Yes? No, we're not, uh, we're not spending time doing that, but where there's something like, uh, for example, with digital asset management, there was a case where we were using color controls and performance was just horrendous, and so we decided then to change that and write some of it ourselves. Yeah, I would say it's sort of opportunistically we're replacing things. So some of the things I talked about earlier, file picker, user picker, some of those were using Telerik controls before for like combo boxes and things and we've replaced those with new versions that don't rely on Telerik. So slowly but surely we're, we're shifting to it's, as others. As Sean reminded me a long time ago, we're not in the controls business, but when we need to have a, uh, a component working fast, <coughs> then we're going to do what's necessary to make it work well. At this point in time, you've taken out a decision as you would three years ago or something like that. I don't think we would change the decision because three years ago, what we, we weren't in the controls business, and at the time we didn't feel that any open source, there was no open source control suite that we felt that we could bank on to not have to worry about updating, and at, le at least we had one provider for this whole suite of controls, so it saved us some effort, but I mean, then it changed. Yeah, the other thing to, to just note is since that time has gone, I mean, we've added additional developers to the company who have some good client-side knowledge. And so it, it's just everything coming together. You know, three years ago, I probably would have made the same decision, but where we're at today, it, it wouldn't make sense to just continue using Telerik as we did before. And I think that we're going to have to make uh, a public statement so that it's not just like a room of people about Telerik, because this question's come up quite a few times. And I believe re more recently it came up that Telerik is actually now telling people the details of sort of... Yeah, they're posting something on their site, I guess. Yeah, so we need to be clear about exactly what we just told you. So does DNN still suck? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I wasn't here last year, so I've just been dying to say that. Yeah, it, sounds, it sounds better when Rob Rex says okay. that, doesn't okay. it? Okay. We'll stroll. Uh, were there uh, any plans to have uh, a license connector implemented in companies for uh, all vendors to be able to use that store? We would sure like to, but that's not in the cards for right now. Any yeah, <laughs> yes. Um, you know, it's one of those things that uh, I had as an interest on personal roadmap, but at, the, at this moment, I think there's just a lot more important things that we want to tackle, and so that's just far down the list. Okay, yeah, so the question is what's happened with the forge more recently that maybe fixes some of the problems that were there. Um, so when we came out with the forge, we did so sort of in conjunction with Microsoft CodePlex. Um, and we created sort of a workflow that you would have to follow when you sign up a new project. So you would have to go to our forge to begin with, you would sign up with your project, then you were taken over to the CodePlex site, and you'd have to sign in, and then you would have to wait, or no, then you have to publish your project, and we would get some web service call back to our site, which would then activate your project, and, but 
that workflow, if it broke down on any of those steps and you did things in the wrong order, you'd be left in this sort of in limbo state and your project would never get published and you would have to send an email and hopefully someone would actually act upon it. So what we did is we decided that we should decouple the forge from CodePlex. If you want to use CodePlex to host your open source project, fine. If you want to host it on GitHub, that's fine as well. And so you can independently choose where you want to host it, put your project there, then go to the forge, register it, and just point to wherever it exists. We just simplified it um, in comparison to what, the way it worked before. Um, the user interface for the forge looks exactly the same, um, but you shouldn't be left with these workflow issues anymore. And if you have a project that is in that state, you're going to have to email me so that I can fix it. But then going forward, um, you should have no problems. But you should try to log, like if you had a problem in the past, you should try logging in and just fixing your project yourself because you have more access to um, tweak any of the fields that are there, um, which you didn't have the ability to do before. And I apologize, there, there, are, um, there are some of you here who had projects that were in that state for a very long time. Stefan Kalman is one. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Adam. When you post a new version of your project on Codeplex, is there some automatic updates of the version on the board, or do you have to do it manually now? You have to do it manually now. Yes, so that, that is another change. So when you, when you produce a new version of your project and you put it on Codeplex or GitHub, you also have to update your project listing in the Forge with the new version number and the new release date, and I guess the new URL as well. That was broken, and that is being fixed right now. Yeah, because there's that unique project um, key that's in your manifest file that, that it's supposed to ask you for. And then if you provide that, it's supposed to publish it to the feed. Uh, will we be able to remove uh, outdated projects out of the forge? Yes. Actually, you can do that yourself. You can log in to the forge and you can just, there's an active or inactive checkbox. You can make it inactive and it, then it'll no longer be in the, found in the feed anymore. Like, if you search, it won't be there. But it'll, yeah, it'll be visible to you. There's no hard delete. It's enough. Okay. So, um, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> You had a turn already, just kidding. Um, I think what's kind of missing out there is, I think a lot of people use WordPress because you can like try it within five minutes, and yeah. you don't lose it after 30 days, it just keeps on going. And of course, most of the scenarios are very trivial, but it just allows people to check it out, and then check it out again, and then try something, and then one day someone do something a bit of a style on it. Right. And I know the numbers don't matter, Yeah, so um, WordPress had ha, WordPress has become very, very popular, and I think one of the reasons is it's very the the barrier to entry to get a WordPress site is very low. It's about as low as it can be, right? And um, so, and similarly, there is some site builders that exist today that are also super easy to spin up a site on. And so, I think that that you're right. You're identifying a problem. And it has resulted in perhaps DNN losing some visibility in the market um, because it, it is a little bit harder to get access to. Internally, there, there has been some discussions about trying to leverage the Azure websites um, and providing a way that you could spin up a DNN platform install on Azure websites. You can already do this today, but you have to go through the Microsoft portal and what we were wanting to do is basically get rid of all those steps and basically make it really easy so you, it's like spinning up a trial 
that like, like you can do today in dnnsoftware.com, but for the platform. Um, I don't know what the status of that is. That was Bruce's, Bruce Chapman's proposal. I don't know if it's moved ahead at this point. Yeah, you know what I'm yet. talking about? Yeah, yeah. not yet. And yeah. plus, you know, there's pros and cons to everything because on the, uh, on the current trial environment, you know, you, you can add certain things to it, but there's certain things that you can't put that if somebody were really trialing and then wanting to move into production, they would, they would be stuck without additional help. Salar, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, that has come up before, um, the idea of having the source code in escrow. And I guess what you're suggesting is the module developer, the commercial module developer, should give the source code to DNN Corp, who can make it available only under very specific circumstances, right, when the, like if the vendor has disappeared. Um, I don't think that that's been explored, but I mean that could be taken up with Will Morganwick and, yeah. and yeah. Beth. You know, the concern is how do you define disappeared? And, you know, next you know, we could release the source code and then we're subject to all the liability for that. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a good idea. It's, it's probably a, bringing, work, bringing up again internally for the yeah. store manager worth, to discuss. It's worth contacting Will. I was just mentioning my concern just thinking through it. And you can never have a legal agreement that's tight enough for everything that you want. And so that's a concern. You know, if somebody is buying something from a vendor, then, you know, it's also possible to have a relationship directly with the vendor to make the code available. Someone you might have an extreme sports accident or something. Yep. Here. 
Right, if it drives revenue, that's what's important. Right. Totally agree, that's on our list. Yes, we didn't talk about roadmap um, beyond 7.3. Um, so there is discussions going on uh, internally about adding a lot of those types, personalization, A-B testing, analytics, forms, things like that to evoke content, um, potentially in 7.4. Uh, the external service. Yes. Yeah. 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 Going back to the previous question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I. Okay. I mean, I, I fully agree with you that the the default install is rather barren, and but it's barren for a reason because we wanted to cut out all the crap and get this thing, thing slimmed down, etc. So there seems to be a field of tension between what the newbies would want versus what the or experienced users would want. And I think that's where, um, where what, we're, what I was talking about earlier in terms of distributions, where that would come in. You know, we as a community could create a distribution or you know, a solution based on DNN that we feel really shows, and you, know, you, hit, you, you hit the road running, what DNN can do. And you roll in the events module and the blog module, you, you have them all nicely painted out on your site at different places, and you have a nice video explaining how this thing works. I think you have a winning solution. But certainly not to kind of burden, of course, the central distribution with something like that. How, how would you, how would you, how, how, how would you, how would you, I mean, I th because at the same time I'm thinking my mobile phone, right, um, I, I now have a Windows phone, and if that's supposed to be, <laughs> yes, yes, I'm on board, I'm on board, finally, the last man in the room, but it, the, the, the thing is, like, that's supposed to be a small store, right, app store, like all the others are saying, oh, you know, Windows phone, you don't have any apps. And I think I was looking for something really obscure, like I needed, I wanted that on my phone, and I checked out, and there's like 10 different apps for that. And like, how do I even begin to define like where to start to get, I don't have the time to compare all this stuff. And it, I think the same thing, there's always that risk with, with our store as well. It's, it's very hard to, to see properly, you know, how to fill your need from just a feed of vendors who are trying to feed you their apps and saying, okay, well, take this one, take this one. And of course, there are vendors that are very aggressive who will label it with every category under the sun. Uh, there's others uh, more conservative, and it's, it's hard to see that. Um, One thing that we introduced, I think, in DNN 6 was um, you, you have, in the extensions area, right, you can choose available modules or modules that are in the forge, but it, it's not surfaced very easily. And the original plan there was that when you, when you install, I think everyone's seen the install screen, you have that um, template that you can choose, and by default it says default website template, but there should have been you know, more than one scenario-based template in that list. And depending on which one you choose, it would choose to install certain modules that that, that template was dependent upon. And that never really fully materialized. But, but that would make it a lot easier. Wow, we have a lot of hands up. <laughs> Who hasn't had a turn? Michael hasn't had a turn. And neither have you. Michael, go ahead. <laughs> You're talking about the control panel. Yeah. Okay.
There is um, a drop down there that has all common admin and host. And by default, it's supposed to choose common. Yeah, and it's, well, that'll be changed for 7.3. It's supposed to choose common. Um, and then, so yeah, every time it comes up, so it should choose common. You can also bookmark um, the modules that are in that list to add them to common really simply and remove them from common. So I think that common category is, is the big one. Yeah, so it's not, it's not easy right now to add additional categories to that list. They're in, they're in the host lists area. Yeah. Yeah. Right. We could make it easier to add additional categories. Well, with the search now, it makes it a little easier, but yeah. Um, Benoit had a question. Uh, I, think we need a few more roles, at least one for editors, people who I agree. Content, but are not technical person. Yeah. And, uh, that would serve as a basis for all module developers, because at the moment, we are all creating this role that is not standard, and it would help to decide what So, so the, traditionally we ship with admin. So when you create a new site, there's the admin role, there's the registered users role, there's the all users sort of pseudo role. But what Benoit is suggesting is there should also be a default uh, module editor or content editor role. Because um, that's a pretty common scenario in most organizations. They don't want to give people full admin, but they want someone who has at least the ability to ed edit content. And you're right that, um, for module developers, they actually have to go and manually create that role and then test their module, and it would be much easier if that role already existed. Yeah, I, I didn't understand what you had said before. I, I thought you were asking for a lawyer role, and I thought, a lawyer? I don't know. <laughs> In the back, B. It's, so it's not on the product roadmap that I'm aware of, but some more background. Uh, there is a, a different streamlined editor that's used in Evoke Social right now, which is different than the one that's used in content. In content, we're still using Telerik, rich text editor. In social, because in social scenarios, it's more, it's facing users that aren't sort of admins, so have less technical skills, and you actually don't want them with the full editing experience like a word processor. Um, but that hasn't been ported to any of the other products at this point. Of course, you should be aware as well that the editor is a, another extension point in the product, so you can create alternate editors. So if you want a more simple editor, you can actually create one and 
tell DNN you want to use that instead. Um, although it sounds like you would rather just use that in mobile scenarios, right, not in desktop scenarios. Um, and so the, the system doesn't have the ability to differentiate at the moment between those different scenarios. But it could because we have some really fancy technology. <laughs> Sebastian? Uh, I have ideas to uh, provide uh, the option to have uh, some specific administrators because I have situations with clients where, where uh, for example, someone is managing uh, the uh, uh, users uh, which are signing in more specific uh, registration form because they want to be, uh, they are just uh, clients who are requ uh, requiring um, some, some information stuff or access to the forum. So I need someone being able to just administrate users but not having the opportunity to um, administrate files uh, going into the event manager and all this stuff. Currently, uh, this is not possible because our security, uh, this security model as an admin is a member of, a administra uh, of the website administrator role and only uh, for security reasons, this admin, members of this administrator's role are able to uh, access uh, administrator So that would, I think, get a little out of hand for us to do that in the product itself, to have a role for each type of functionality. But you can certainly do that yourself. Yeah, you can create a user administrator and go into the, the page where the user administration module lives, change the permissions. Yes, you... you it's, a, it's supposed to work. Okay. It did work. Okay. I don't think it really helps. It. There, there was a discussion on, on the forums about uh, okay. improving these in the future versions. Okay. Two requests. Two requests. Yeah. <laughs> I know the one you're talking about specifically was just inside the user management module itself. It had something because it's used in multiple places. But. Inside the user management module. Yeah. The, the, the goal for it yeah. is on each there. Yeah, yeah. No, I know what you mean. But in general, for any of the other admin pages, you can go in and change the permissions for them. It's just the users, which has this bug. But it, yeah, it can be fixed. There's no reason why it couldn't be fixed. You just changed the code? I think you should add a JIRA request for that. I don't think that there is anything that I've seen which, which has asked for that functionality. I think the user picker was just introduced, well, the revised version of it was just introduced in seven, seven yeah, recently. Because before, I think previously you had to type in like the username and know exactly what the users, yeah, and that was not friendly at all, <laughs> yeah. Do you understand the question about how he's missing out on the opportunity? Yeah, because they're not really 
a big partner. So this really plays into the community partner. So you're saying because you're not an official partner, yeah, there's no commission opportunity. I I'll follow up with our, our VP sales, and that's where our um, partner program exists today. It was my understanding that this community partner program that I was talking about earlier, that any, any vendor that's doing services with DNN should have the opportunity to offer a commercially licensed product, and if they do so, that they are eligible to get some commission from that deal without funneling it through some intermediary. It's just what we need to do is make sure that it's easy for people to leverage that. So one of the problems was that you know we've had a we had a um, partner program. We made changes to it. Some companies remained with it at you know various levels, and others disappeared off it. But that doesn't mean that they're not viable. They just don't meet certain criteria. So how do we make sure that they can benefit still? Yeah. Um, no, <laughs> there isn't any regional marketing efforts going on. It's still fairly generic and global, I guess, is the only way I can put it. Yeah. yeah. I think it's at least the UK is an English-speaking country, and most of the marketing material that we produce is English-speaking. It's way worse. It's a bait. Sorry, it's a way bigger problem in countries where other languages are predominant, right? So those folks have a real uphill battle in terms of selling DNN today because they don't have the materials in their native language, so. Can I add something? <laughs> no. Can we stop? <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh. <laughs> Yeah, so if you're, if you're expecting materials, they might not be coming, but if you're doing co-marketing, like Excess has done, yeah. very open to that. And that's been successful. We, yeah. There's been quite a number of events that have been hosted. And, and we work together with the and they do sometimes Thank you. That was a good point. Find out too who you should really work with on a direct basis so that you don't have to you know, kind of shotgun mail to get a hold of somebody. Uh, this wasn't really supposed to be the Sean and Bob show. 
So if you have questions for these fine gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, Peter said that later on tonight, uh, if people are willing, he'd lead a hike around the vineyard. Sorry, just one thing. I also have a question for you, and is uh, what do you think about this uh, effort that we started from the thing that we got from last year there? You think it's valuable? Uh, you are willing? No, no. No, that, that's not what I want. I want, uh, I want, you, I want you to help. Uh, I mean, do you think it's something... Um, one of the questions I was really wanted to ask to him and to all of uh, us, is uh, how do you think it's the open source side of DNN, not from, from the corporation, but from, from us, members of the community. We are always talking about DNN being open source, but we are really contributing to it. Uh, do you think that the open source side of DNN is uh, live and it's uh, working well? Uh, you know, all the previous uh, DNN modules that used to be on CodePlex, half of them are dead. So that's one of the reasons maybe why there are not so many modules in the default installation. So is there people here willing to contribute to that? Uh, is there a way for us as a community to get more people uh, attracted to participate into the Nuke, into the forums? We have a wonderful forum in our community, so please come there and participate, help people, ask questions, what do you think about that? Do you think that there is a value in this or, or not? Or we are just wasting the time? One, one of the ideas is, and it's not yet materialized, it's uh, that uh, DNN Connect could be also uh, like uh, the forge in 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 the nn uh, software.com so we would like to make it more visible for people to go there and to participate and my ideal would be that the nn connect would be a, a place for people like us to get together and to form teams there to participate into the projects that that would be really 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 nice there was some guy uh, maintaining the forums there and he's been asking for help. So for me, that would be a very good uh, way for, for, for DNN Connect to help you as a developer. Yeah, I think that uh, your Philip is already To, to your question, like how does uh, sorry, yeah, how does the how can DNN Connect help you as an open source developer? I, I think there are many facets to this. I mean, one of them uh, you heard from Bisense, like connecting people, trying to create uh, dynamics around the project teams. Although I mean, you know, it's happening also to a lesser extent in DNN on DNNsoftware.com, but you know, we are trying to focus on this. Um, what what you said, you know, providing a home in terms of a branding name, whatever, you know, this is, this is DNN Connect, and then someone else might come in and, and take over the project and, and not be, um, let's say, not be held back by the fact that, oh, maybe, you know, it's Stefan's module, like, no, this is, you know, this is ours, this is, this is the community module. Um, and thirdly, of course, we've been playing with the idea of, um, and 
of the of the kickstart uh, thing of trying to bring uh, need and and talent together. So if you have a customer that says you know that that is willing to pay X amount of money towards having something developed, that we have some kind of a mechanism to either publicize that or connect that to to developers. One other thing: How can we help you? Uh, how? Can we both help us each other? If there is anything that any of you think uh, we are missing there, just ask for it. I mean, it's not our, we don't consider it, uh, I mean, that's my opinion, we don't consider it our website, not for sure, it's not that way. So our intention is that this is a, a foundation for something bigger. And uh, again, we are not competing against the NS software. For us, and our view is that it is a, a strong relationship to just keep growing DNN uh, on. So for sure there is no uh, hard feelings against any of us. Uh, and it's a matter of just growing the, the community. So if there is something that you think we can help you, that's for sure. You need a, a, a specific area there where you would like a, a, a page that you maintain and you have your own thing in there. There is no problem on doing that. We, we, we briefly did that, like the, uh, last year we, uh, we were handed uh, a, very kindly by DNN Corp, the DNN Social Solution. Um, we had a couple of issues of like keeping up to speed and getting it because it wasn't as trivial as installing regular DNN. And in the end when we huddled together and said, okay, now we're going to get serious with this site, what are we going to do? Actually, one of my goals was, and you know, our goals here was we have to show how DNN platform could work and solve all these things. I mean, we have to showcase that, right? That has to work. So, uh, yeah. Uh, try to build something just by using the office of side of it. Yeah. So. And also, you know, for us as well, like everything that we use on the site, uh, the intention is to have that open. It, it needs to be, you know, oh, we use this. If you want to use it, there it is. Yeah. There was some question. Salah? Very quickly, three thousand euros. For now, we don't have it, <laughs> right? But but to 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 answer to answer your question, I I, I cannot. For, for it, it falls, you know, it, it it does fall inside of our mandate. If if you look at the statutes, so it, you know, it's not excluded that we would ever partake of such an adventure. However, you know, right now, I, I first want to see our community get established before we make that kind of a commitment, James. Right. Um, and it certainly wasn't 3,000 to be there because I asked Ben from Typo, who's been arranging it for this, the CMS uh, community. It was, it was a lot less than that, so it's okay. affordable. And I would say the brand exposure alone to see if it could be worth the end paying whatever the cost is for the view of the end yeah. connect you can go. Yeah. Um, I think my, my second point from good looking at those communities is I think the Typo and the Drupal communities, there's a lot you can learn from because they've established. Right, good point, good point. Yes, Daniel. Yeah, because um, here's a, an impression that's always been with me a little bit. I think in the Microsoft world, everybody kind of wants to make money. And at the same time, we're all really, really glad to get all this free stuff that other people are doing. And I think what kind of happens is that people tend to want to get the free stuff, and then they create a module themselves, and then they figure, how much can I charge for it? And this works, but I mean, I believe that 
the more you guys give away for free, the more you guys are going to get customers that are really, really cool. Our biggest customers, I would say almost all of them, came simply because they found us doing things for the community in Switzerland, giving away stuff for free. Our, our work with Too Sexy Content, I mean, we've, we've given away at least one year's work for free in there. But it's paid off. More than that. So this is the cheapest marketing you guys can do. So I'd really like to encourage you guys, do things, also things like, you know, like, like skins and things like that. Because not everybody's a programmer, but pe some people can write good stuff, some people can create cool tutorial movies. It doesn't really matter what, but it's the cheapest marketing you guys will ever be able to do, and you'll get customers. It's, there's a real business behind this. As Daniel said, not everybody of us is a developer. So if you want to blog, you want to write articles, our site is open for everyone to participate. Uh, he already has a blog there, a couple of you have there. So feel free to participate there. There was a question, Rob? I, 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 fully, I fully agree with you, and I remember the, uh, the ass-kicking session that, uh, that, that we introduced there. Like, okay, well, so now we're going to make a list of who's going to do what. And, and of course, the, the road to hell is, is paved with very good intentions. Um, I, I, I make no illusion that I don't think this is going to change from one day to the next. Um, you know, the, the, still, you know, there's many people here who will sit here and go like, oh yeah, you know, I could do that, and they would stick up their hand if I asked them, could you do this, and then the minute they leave the, the conference, it's kind of gone to the back of their head. Um, I, I just feel that certainly that there, there are a few people that I know, that I know well, who are actually eager to start doing stuff, and I'm just providing a home for that. Whether the rest of you will jump on the bandwagon or not remains to be seen. I hope it does create some momentum. But at least we have like, a common vehicle for it moving forward and we will have the first three, four, five people contributing uh, in the near future. Sergey. Which uh, some, something automatic or something that is created by hand?
So we're currently using a, a combination of active forums and Q&A on the site. And it's a really bad combination because both modules um, sort of work in a, given, in, in a certain way, but they're both doing the job not perfectly. So we're looking for new ways, for better ways to, well, provide support on the site through the tools we have to provide and we have to create probably, well, you have to create or we together in whatever kind of scenario. But currently we can't do that. Exactly. Well, actually, I can't. It's it's not supported. <laughs> the module doesn't support that functionality. Actually, yeah. can I, so one one more thing. I think though, what is very important, and and that's for all of you to just try to get your, your head around, um, you should try to switch to a mindset of like, hey, um, is, instead of like, hey, should, you know, um, can't we change the site to do this, to actually think like, okay, I can change that. Because it's, it's your site as well now, right? It's, it's not just ours, it's yours. So, you know, if you come with a great proposal, and you say, okay, this is what, I'm, what I plan to do, uh, what do you guys think? And, you know, I'm going to program it. That's... One, one way that um, we see that uh, website or that community working on is uh, through sponsors. And when I mean sponsors, I, I'm not talking about money. I consider a sponsor, for example, Peter, on the, on the blog. He just took the blog, and, and we consider that the blog is his job, in a way. Uh, Philip can work on other things. For example, we were discussing on having uh, 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 what was that? Uh, a use case? No, a gallery, a gallery of websites there in the end. Someone that can curate and and build up a very nice gallery of websites there. So if there is someone uh, wanting to do that, please call us. We will provide whatever tools we can. And then we will have a very nice uh, place where people will come to see what we are doing with DNN. The only thing is that we cannot, the three of us, do it all. So if there is someone else, for example, that can uh, create and uh, customize and configure and, and curate a gallery page uh, there where we put all the pictures that will be taken during the conference, uh, that's again another place where we will need just maybe one or two hours of your time and you'll be, in a way, responsible of that section. And that's the way we consider that it's the only way for us to manage a community website. It's not the, the three of us, it's uh, all of us. And that's what we want, that uh, all of us participate into that project. So if you have any kind of project in mind, uh, please uh, put it on, on the forums, on the website, approach us, whatever you want. We are just here trying to improve this thing. And, and we put the showcase together with you? Yeah. Is that, is it a showcase of pictures or a showcase of sites or? Well, yeah, okay. Yeah, because we'll, yeah, we have a showcase already, but obviously we want us quite bold, right? <laughs> no, I know, we need submissions to it, but we already have software that shows the sites oh, yeah. off, right? So. Actually, in, in Switzerland, it's fairly simple. Uh, what you need is statutes 
and uh, the, the minutes of the first meeting that you hold. And the, and the first meeting can be just the committee uh, with themselves because you're founding something new and you don't have any members yet. Um, that enough, you know, a signed copy of the statutes, uh, of, you know, signed by more than one person, that's all you need. And with that, you can go to a bank and say, okay, we're an association. Uh, here you go. This is uh, this is the paperwork, and indeed, I mean, they they checked all that, and and we got the um, the, the bank account opened. And the statutes have some uh, base criteria in Swiss law, so it should you know it should state the aims, it should state how the association makes money, and it should state what happens if the association dies. Like you, you need to have some kind of a description of the end scenario for the whole thing. Um, and that basically should give you uh, enough trust um, to, you know, to see where your money will go for the members and it, it should make things clear. And I've, I've tried to be as explicit as I could in the, in the statutes. So usually you, the statutes are published? Like right, then yeah. they are, they are. Yeah, yeah, so anyone can go and look at them. Yeah, so yeah, exactly. That's what yeah, you're yeah. wondering. So the, the statutes are, are, they're just at the moment, we plan to throw the switch as we announced it this morning. Those pages have all been prepared on the site. The statutes page is visible already. Oh, the statutes page is visible already. Okay. Right, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. No, we can't see any issue with that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's true. So, yeah. What, one of one of the things. So, so membership is personal. I I, I mentioned it earlier as well uh, uh, this morning, but it, it, there is no mechanism to mass enlist your employees as a company. Uh, by paying a company fee. I, I, you know, we, we felt specifically we do not want to have some kind of a commercial influence of, of larger companies stepping in and going, hey, you know, I'm a, you know, I've got like 10 uh, employees here and they're all going to be a member and all of a sudden, you know, all the 10 and voting for you know, whatever they want. Um, th that, that, that was not our intention. Our intention is that this association, it's, it's a personal thing. It's you and us. You know, you and the committee, and, and that makes up the association. Uh, one, one of the, the, the goals the, of this association is uh, from year to year to organize this conference. So between today and tomorrow, we have to find uh, a new spot for a new place for next year. So if there is people interested in that, uh, we are willing to collaborate. And the other thing that we were discussing, not only the three of us, but with uh, other people, is that if you think uh, would be a good idea, it would work or not, uh, holding a bigger conference. So not just this uh, small scale conference where we all knew each other, the, the familiar typical conference, but something bigger, uh, talking about 200 people, 300 people, you think that this is possible, this is valuable? Uh, do you think it will work or not? That's something that it's there. I mean, it's not just that we think uh, needs to be done. We have had a couple people saying that it could work. Um, we are not yet that sure. Uh, I don't remember ever telling anyone to not do conferences because there's always been, like even, like there's been the DNN cons and DNN, Day of DNNs and so we never discouraged that. In fact, we encouraged it and sponsored every one of those events when they came up. Um, but as, as far as your question about upcoming conferences, there is no DN, DNN world in 2014. And that's as far as we do business planning is like annually. So. Come November, December this year, we'll 
that's when the discussion will be on the table of whether there would be a large-scale conference in 2015. And then really we'll be looking at from the standpoint of, you know, what sort of return do we get? So right now we are sponsoring quite a few conferences, as Sean mentioned. If we take a look at other marketing activities, is there a greater return? Does that maybe support somebody else who's doing a conference instead of us? You know, when you have a big conference and everybody already knows one another and it's just buddies getting together, uh, you know, does that really lead to the benefits we want? And that was part of the problem with the, uh, at least the previous two that I attended. I think folks answered your question. There needs to be a commercial focus to a larger conference. Well, it's not just to us. It's even the people that attend. Is there a benefit? The community. Yeah. The community. Well, that's why I want to do you think people will come if we organize something based well, on that? Uh, so the question is, how do you get customers, potential customers, to come to people outside of the core community? Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know the answer to it, but I would say if you're going to find something bigger, that question has to be asked. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, what would be the advantage of, of organizing a bigger event? Uh, because then there should be now people who are not being here because this event is too small. And they would come if the event is twice as big as now? No. Well, that, that remains the question. Yeah. <laughs> it's a different approach. You yeah. try to, to, to get customers in here, uh, in a conference. This is a community meeting. It's not a conference in this, this, uh, uh, in this aspect. Um, and the other one would be like in the day of Dublin News we did in, uh, uh, in Paris uh, four years ago where we had uh, all the space and, and had a conference targeting not only to One, one of the ideas was just not making uh, uh, the conference based uh, solely uh, on, on DNN, but being a dual conference on uh, .NET and uh, DNN. So we could attract uh, .NET developers to come to the conference to know uh, DNN. And so, I mean, the idea is, uh, again, trying to spread the word on DNN and growing the community. And we will not grow the community if we are the, the usual suspects all the time. to take ownership of it. Yeah. So I'm not completely volunteering myself personally, but I'm willing to participate in it. And I was, um, I, I was uh, reaching out to, to, to possible venues already last week um, just to get an idea if it's financially possible or not. And I would say it is if we get enough sponsors. And in the past, we usually had enough sponsors. So I, I think technically it is possible and we're probably going to find a team of people um, to organize it. I'm not afraid of that. Yeah, I think exactly. <laughs> and there was, and it was actually, there's, it's, it, it, of course, we just, we, we're currently, we're just juxtaposing them as, you know, exclusive. But of course, you could also imagine um, uh, an event which actually makes the two things happen. So the weekend for community and the Friday for the one day conference. The, the only thing is, of course, if, you, if you're going to hold a bigger conference, you probably want that 
in a in an urban area, you, you, it's like this is probably not going to attract a whole bunch of farmers to come out and and look at DNN. Um, so <laughs> you might want to do that in an urban area, but it's totally f thinkable that you would have the Friday event in Milan, and then for the weekend you come out here. Completely agree. That's two different things, I think, and we must uh, we must continue to have these kinds of events here. When, when is the event, Dave? When is the event? In, the, in London. No, no, not where, when? To provide a bit of insight, so I know that some of you are quite disappointed that we didn't have a DNN world last year or this year, but it really came down to being a financial decision. So we really wanted to set the bar pretty high when we did the, the two DNN worlds that we did in Florida. Um, and we wanted to attract a lot of customers to come to those events and really get a great impression of DNN. But we, the overall budget for those events was three or four hundred thousand dollars. We lost substantial money on those events in order to put them on. And so then it comes down to, that comes out of marketing budget. So then it's a cost decision. And so we would all love to have the DNN World event like that every year. Um, but it's, again, it's challenging. Yeah, it, but it wasn't even just the money. It was also we took uh, how many people out of the development team and, yeah. and elsewhere to do that. So yeah. it's a substantial time hit as well. Daniel? 
Can you accept it? I have a technical question. Okay. Okay. Because um, we believe that actually a lot of the interactions in the future are going to be JavaScript applications. Yeah. So um, what we're really kind of envisioning is that we create applications like in, in, in Knockout or more like the Angular, and that we have to fake the path so that Google, of course, will make something different. Now, the current behavior with the new URL provider is that if the page exists and we just add a slash and track things, it still goes the same page, which is great. Mm -hmm. And we'd like to build on that. But my question is, is this going to stay stable, or is this an accident? <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't think that, because, I mean, the, the advanced URL management that's in the current version was based on URL master, which was originally built by Bruce. And I don't know for a fact that Bruce was thinking of those problems when he constructed it. There may have been other reasons why he did it that way. So the right person to ask about that would be him. But as far as it remaining stable, uh, I believe, well, it, yeah, we, we plan on, we don't plan on like totally changing URL management yet again. Because <laughs> um, every time we do that, you know, it's fairly disruptive to the ecosystem and like everyone's site that needs to be indexed. Yeah, and to do it in a performant way, yeah, so yeah, I could count on it being stable. There isn't, so there's a lot of debate about taking dependencies on JavaScript frameworks, um, which I still, I mean, the decision at the time was we didn't want to. We decided that we'd been down that road before, taking dependencies on Telerik and other things, and then when something better comes along, it's very difficult to make the migration. Uh, so that's why we decided to just include the bootstrap library in the skin um, because then it could be swapped out because not everybody wants to take on the extra overhead of all of these frameworks. Um, but then there's a downside that then you can't depend on it being there. Um, so I think that uh, as we look at some of the technology future stuff that Bob and I covered, um, Angular is very popular right now and it might well, and so is Bootstrap. So it, we might have to revisit that decision. Um, I'm just, yeah, I don't know yet until we start doing some research into it. Couldn't you deliver it more as a new JavaScript uh, uh, library management? So it's just been loaded when needed. Yeah, yeah, it, that sounds simple, but <laughs> it's not, yeah, no, it's a little bit more complicated than that. But yeah, so it, almost like dependency injection when an app, meaning a module, requests that it needs to use a certain library, that's the only time those libraries should be included as references in the page. Um, that would be an all, the ultimate sort of solution, and I think that's what you're suggesting, right? Yeah. I have a question for you, Sean, and also for, for you guys. It's about uh, what I told you before about uh, the MBC pattern, the MVP presenter that is on DNN. Yeah. Do you think it's challenging for you as companies to find people 
working on, on web forms nowadays? Uh, is it really a problem to get people um, knowing and willing to work on web forms? Is that uh, a change to MBC so strong that there is no more people interested in, in that thing? Because uh, recently I've been asking for people uh, that are uh, willing to collaborate with one of the open source projects which actually was built using the MVP uh, model and seems that uh, other than uh, Stefan and a few others, there was no one really uh, interested in, into that model. So I'm a bit... Uh, well, maybe a wrong. better question is how many of you are having difficulty hiring developers in your business because they don't want to work on web forms? Well, actually, the, the, maybe the, the question is uh, how many of you are, are having difficulties hiring people? <laughs> <laughs> so that's a different thing. Well, it's, it's not just that. Like, when you get people to actually work on it, it's just keeping them productive and happy doing it. It's also working on something old, right? Um, so that, that's another part of the problem. And then the other part of the problem. Yeah. And how many are hearing? So, so this was a change that we started to see in the last few years. It, initially, MVC is just a technology choice. Most developers know what it is. They know sort of what the difference between that and web forms are. Clients were oblivious to it, right? They were like, I want certain functionality, build it. <laughs> um, but now we're starting to hear clients actually say, we want MVC because that's what Microsoft is promoting. How many of you are actually hearing that? Right, so it's fallen out of favor, you're right. So there is no content anymore that's being created around web forms. All of the like, .NET conferences focus on MVC, Web API, and anything that's new and shiny. Well, yeah. Right, it's a, it's a religious argument that you're not going to win. <laughs> yeah. Eventually you just have to jump on the wave and ride with it rather than against it and whether there's a good reason to or not. I think it's more urgent. I mean, part of the problem also is we're talking to a crowd of people who are already working with the platform today and already doing web forms. And there's a big community out there that isn't. And, you know, I go through this on a regular basis when talking to people, when trying to hire, when going to events. I mean, it's, it's challenging. Although, so a, the counter argument to that is I haven't heard the same criticisms of SharePoint. And sh sh SharePoint, well, there's, there's criticisms of SharePoint, don't get me wrong, but, <laughs> but I haven't heard the web forms argument as much. Um, yeah. One thing, though, to also bear in mind is, you know, when we showed the technology slide, we weren't just talking about MVC. I mean, we're really talking about doing much more than just that. So the MVC is part of the conversation. It's not all of it. No. Well, so there's, yeah, so, I mean, you could try to say that DNN supports MVC because it supports Razor templating for modules. but. Most purist .NET developers will see through that and say, well, we need the routing too, and 
you know, we're looking for, we're looking for a page with no view state, right? We're looking for web forms to go away. <laughs> um, so it's a little more than that. Although, yeah, the razor is an important part of NBC. Yeah. That's exactly the reason why people see through it. Yeah, but in the UMC world, where it is not the point, it's a great complaint. Yeah, it's a discipline. Something I raised in the um, in, a, in a blog post recently. Maybe, maybe you can enlighten us on on, on that one uh, about the user and user login disconnect. Um, <laughs> I was so just in the intro. I, I I wrote this down actually in a blog post not too long ago. It's on dnnsoftware.com. Uh, please go and see it. Um, but it was just some casual observations that I made as I was working as an admin for a site for about. Um, let's say 80 people that come to that site and just struggling with uh, multiple logins that they were creating because you know they forgot their password or you know they used Facebook authentication there and then they were at work and their Facebook authentication didn't work anymore so they just kept on creating accounts and I, I kept on seeing new accounts with you know new email addresses pop up but it's you know same person um, and you know my suggestion was can we uh, can we code our way out of this mess? Like, can we create, uh, for instance, uh, some kind of a management interface where, you know, when talking about user management, of course, it's something that uh, uh, is something we would dearly like to tackle and, 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 and change a bit. Um, but uh, to be able to say, okay, well, this account and these and these accounts are the same, or to actually completely decouple logins from authentications from user identities so that you say, well, you know, regardless of which, you know, of that, that authentication, at one point I'm going to bind them to the same user identity, uh, regardless if they logged in through Facebook or, or thing. Anyway. So. Yeah, so it is a good blog that you wrote. Um, and the, when we introduced the feature of authentication providers, um, I don't think it was as complete of a solution as what we wanted it to be. And so I think it does need some work. Especially, I mean, in Daniel's session, he talked about making it as simple as possible for people to sign in. Um, and that's all part of it, right? So en enabling the Facebook, Twitter logins um, in a way that actually works. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that that is worth consideration for sure. Yeah. I think we have all the basic parts there. It's just not exposed in a very good way. Because the idea originally was a user should be able to have multiple sort of keys on their keychain that they can use. Yeah, so this has come to our attention in the last couple of weeks, uh, that there is active web bots that are going to DNN sites with public registration and registering tons of users. 
and they originally we found that they were coming from China initially, and they would fill in first name, last name, email, and it's not entirely obvious why they're even doing this, but those, yeah, because the uh, user profile is public as well, they can include, include links in that, and then it becomes, like, it, it can, then they have links going back to a certain site, and it increase their SEO rank. Yeah, that's the page Yeah, so if, I don't know if any of you have seen this happening. Yeah, it's not happening on dnnsoftware.com because we don't use the default registration. We have a registration page that's set up with a registration module on it. So the bot seems to only look for default URLs. So the way that public registration works out of the box. So you're excited about that? Like, <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's a, I have a question then for DNN Connect. So, um, in order to be a participant on DNN Connect, you don't have to be a paying member, correct? You could, you can, you can sign, be, a, be a registered user, and but there will probably be private areas on DNN Connect for paid members. I know of a software that does that really well. Yeah. <laughs> but there's no real need to, to have something that's kept privately. I mean, there's no... Yeah. There's no We haven't created one. Um, I haven't looked online recently. I, I was actually <laughs> prior, like this last week, I was looking for comparative performance information because that's the focus of 7.3. I wanted to see perhaps how we stack up against the, the PHP CMSs, but I couldn't even really find any good data on that. Yeah.
Well, and it also, I think, carries more credibility if it's a third party that writes something like that, because then they seem unbiased. I mean, if you, <laughs> what do you think we're going to produce? <laughs> we're going to be definitely pick the attributes where we're the winner. <laughs> So I think customers hopefully see through some of that kind of propaganda, right? They really look for a third party. I know. We used to have that on the website, a uh, comparison between the different, at least evoke content and, and platform, and that's not on the new website, and I'm not aware that anything's going on in marketing to create that at the moment. They're a little short -handed. Any last question, and maybe we should stop? Or we stop it here and... We go, yeah? Okay, thank you.